What's going on everyone? Welcome to another strategy session. Today we are covering a really cool one, a suggestion from one of our War Room members to uh, do a whole series actually reviewing the missions. This is uh, the first one in our series. We're reviewing mission number 11, that's the retrieval mission, and exactly how to play it from a strategic level. What different armies, what different armed play styles can do, how, what secondaries work on it, just how generally you should approach this mission. We're gonna go through week by week and break down all of them, so this will be a nine week series for the nine competitive GT missions. Then we might even cobble it all together and make it one package, you know? Who knows, who knows? So uh, in this example, I have set up a Dark Eldar army and a Custodes army. The reason I have chosen these two armies in specific is to highlight two different extremes to the game. A very defensive force, this Custodes army, very tough to kill, kind of the immovable object. And then Dark Eldar, uh, very fast, lots of small units, lots of uh, flexibility around the table. And this, kind of, this is going to kind of come out as the unstoppable force. So two extreme different play styles so you can really highlight the different ways to play such a mission as retrieval because retrieval is one of the most balanced missions in my opinion it is a six objective mission with a hold one scenario so meaning if you hold one objective at the start of your command phase you will get five points two objectives will get you 10 and more than your opponent for the 15. it's really easy to score points in this mission and because it's in hammer and anvil deployment you have a lot of depth to it right here we have two three four five six raiders a little slith and urkel party with an archon over here we got uh, two Galadius tanks, three Telemons, Trajan, and a shield captain. So there's a few ways you can look at playing the uh, Custodes or the Dark Eldar here, or basically just playing Retrieval in general. Uh, the way I would define it is the aggressive stance or the defensive stance. So you want to make sure that whatever you choose for a strategy is in line with your personal play style, in line with what your army is designed to do, and all that. So in this case, the custodies are very much designed to be a defensive immovable wall. They're probably going to take that defensive stance, whereas the Dark Eldar is very fast, mobile, flexible. They'll probably take the more aggressive approach. So with that in mind, you want your whole game plan to synergize around those fronts. That's why I'm bringing it up. So the Custodes player should take more defensive secondaries, whereas the Dark Eldar should take more aggressive offensive secondaries. You with your own personal armies, maybe you don't play Custodes or Dark Eldar, you can take these principles and apply them to your own factions as well. I'm using these two armies again just because they're extreme examples here. So Custodes, if they're going to take defensive secondaries, take a defensive strategy, what does that actually look like on the table? Well, in a six objective mission where it's holding uh, one gives you five points, two gives you ten points, it's probably in the Custodes player's best interest to just set up camp on two objectives, and that's ten points right there for primary return, ten, 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 give or take forty points, and that's a pretty respectable primary score. That's a decent plan for primary. I think the alternative would be the Custodes player spreading out all over the table, and then if they try to fight for multiple objectives, it makes them very isolated and easy to kind of defeat in certain portions of the table. Whereas if they really just sit and make the plan, I'm gonna hold two objectives, don't come mess with me, this is a pretty safe plan to score 40 primary points. So that's a pretty good plan for primary that's in line with our relatively, relative to the Dark Eldar army, uh, relatively slow custodies force, relatively uh, easily move blocked, uh, not it doesn't have enough units to really play all six objectives, much like the Dark Eldar army can. So that's one of the things we're going to be looking at with the Custodes here. So with that in mind, let's take a look at our other defensive options. Other defensive secondaries that are pretty good in retrieval are uh, While We Stingly Fight. It's a classic, or actually to the last as it's called now. Uh, your three most expensive units, Telamon A, B, and C. Can this Dark Eldar army realistically kill the Telamon? It is possible. It's rather unlikely. It's really just a matter of how lucky Dark Lances get because the combat will just not get it done if the, if the Custodes player uses their stratagems for defensive abilities. Um, I think it's a pretty safe one, so that's one to keep, consider with this defensive strategy. They, you can really, if you can keep your Telemons alive, which that's kind of what this army is designed to do. Um, if you keep your Telemons alive and you're collecting 10 points a turn on primary, you are now at 15 secondary points for to the last and... Uh, 40 points on primary and you haven't done anything. You've just parked your army in that 
uh, section of the table right there. If we're doing that, maybe we could look at minimize losses. That's the mission specific secondary. Minimize losses makes you to tally the total number of units in your army. I mean, this isn't a full custodies force, but let's call it 10 um, for sake of argument. 10 units, or Dark Eldar has like 25, and then you divide it into quarters. So uh, in the custodies case, every two and a half units killed is 25%. In the Dark Eldar's case, every six and change units killed is two, is 25%. So at the end of the game, you calculate how much percent of your army is left alive. 75%, uh, 50%, and 25% left being alive are the breakpoints. So if you have more than 75% of your army alive, you'll actually score a full 15. If you have between 50 and 75, that next bracket, let's say you have 63% of your army left alive based on number of units destroyed, uh, then you score a 10 and then the next bracket, that 25 to 50% of your army left alive, so now you've lost more than half your stuff, you'll score a five, and then if you lost a lot of your stuff, zero to 25% left alive, you'll only score zero. So, um, in this specific game plan, the strategy is to camp out on two objectives, uh, stay alive, and I'll double down on staying alive. That seems pretty good. I'm not going to overextend. I'm not going to try to interact with this much of the table. The Dark Eldar player can have all that with his really fast stuff. I'm going to set up camp, hide behind these walls, put some obsec on these objectives, these obsec characters, and use my heroic intervention stratagems, maybe physically block out the base of the objective entirely, use my stratagems for only defense, minus one strength from incoming Dark Lances, CP rerolls on vulnerable saves, uh, Tangle Footage will get a charge to fail, and stopping rerolls in close combat. I think that's pretty much the only strats that I need to do this game. And that's, that's the plan. That's the plan right there. So what about the last secondary? What other defensive secondaries are there as options? Um, we could take Raise the Banners. Um, specifically with this Custodes set of models, there aren't too many models that can raise banners. I often like to take random infantry squads, Venatari, Sagittarium, allies, to potentially give you some flexibility to raise some banners. Because if you're going to camp out on two objectives all game, it's not a lot of banners to raise, but you do have two for ten pretty much all game long. Um, two objectives, two points on turn two, three, four, five, and at the game's end and that would be 10 points right there. And of course, if the Custodes player does get the opportunity, they can always wander over to a banner at the end of the game and plant a bunch. Uh, if the Dark Eldar player has kind of killed his whole army trying to break this castle over the course of the game, you can always get more points later. So it's got that upswing in such a big objective mission, although Custodes are not really the army to take advantage of that. Um, I don't think Stranglehold or Engage are really good options for this style of defense approach. A lot of players will typically try to uh, Use Stranglehold or Engage in All Fronts, Retrieve Octarius data as the go-to secondaries. And um, I don't think that really works for such a defensive style. Like I said, you always want to take secondaries that are intrinsic to the strategy here. I'm not even thinking about bringing it down. I'm not even thinking about uh, grinding them down or anything like that. Because my strategy here is just to stay alive and sit on these two objectives. And that's a very viable strategy. At this point, you have a points factory. You've locked in... Uh, 40 points on secondaries, 10 for banners, 15 for to the last, and, fifth, and uh, theoretically 15 on minimized losses, if we're being honest here. So that's 40 points on secondaries. So that's pretty good. And then if you have 40 points on primaries and then 10 points on paint, that's a 90. So whatever your Dark Eldar opponent has to do, it's got to either degrade that score by actually fighting Telemons, getting to the last, getting to those minimized losses, basically do what your Custodes army is designed to take to the face, or uh, have their own independent strategy that's trying to do it. So let's shift gears and talk about what the Dark Eldar is doing, the aggressive approach. How does this one look? This is one where you are in retrieval, specifically trying to hold three objectives, uh, and, and at least two of them. You're going to hold at least two for ten, by virtue of throwing so much stuff in your opponent's face and just doing aggressive movements for turns one, two, three, and four, that at the end of the game, that regardless of the end of the game, that through middle turns, you're just gonna have things on these backfield objectives that are, no one has time to shoot at them because there's just things going in their face and there's too many layers to it. If you put a dedicated transport on an objective with a unit inside, with a character nearby, first they have to kill the transport, then they have to kill the guys inside, then they have to kill the character. This is also from downfield. Only so many weapons have range to this. You could make this a little bit more challenging, putting yourself in this forest 
and barely towing the objective, getting even further from your opponent. It's just too much of a cumbersome tax and it's not worth people's attempt. So you can really do that. That's your plan for primary is not necessarily I'm so tough I can just sit here and glom on two objectives. It's in the aggressive approach your plan is to just be pushing forward. I'm going forward and doing it. This is also um, if you have objectives that are just purely in the open like this and or, or maybe this one they're just in the open and they're really vulnerable. This is where having something like the bodyguards and I'm putting these slits in Urgul on the top of this rune for effect and so you can see them but basically these slits in Urgul are here as bodyguards for an Archon and they're going to be on the bottom floor behind this line of sight blocking wall this wall is solid and then the objective in the open that would normally be a big problem we're just going to get shut off but this is where just using the bodyguard rule can make such a tremendous difference I've done this a million times uh, other top players and our war room coaches have done this uh, bodyguard is a really big lifesaver in missions like retrieval where you for the aggressive player, for the aggressive strategy, because you need something to hold your backfield objectives that isn't just going to get shot off. And uh, if they have like decent indirect fire, it can very well be the case that they do just blow you up. Um, so having bodyguard can be tremendously useful there. So the plan for primary is to just throw yourself forward and sustain 10 points a turn, 10 points a turn, 10 points a turn, 10 points a turn for your 40 points. And you might swing up if you can get. Uh, 15 by being really aggressive effectively and that's your 45 uh, in this game unlike a lot of games having bottom of turn doesn't matter so much uh, in a lot of games bottom of turn you can make sure that um, you get 15 points at the end of the game by kind of walking on the majority objectives so long as your army is alive that can be a huge swing if you're stalemating it out in like the scouring which we'll get to in a different week but the scouring your primary scores are fives and zeros fives and zeros fives and zeros and then all of a sudden, I won second, I'm getting 15 points at the end of the game. That's an enormous percentage shift. You know, like of the 30 primary points scored total, half of them were scored on the bottom of turn five. You know, that matters a ton. Whereas in this game, scores cap at 45, both players have a 40 before we even get to bottom of turn five. I guess it doesn't really matter if you get those extra five points. It could, it could. But percentage wise, it matters a lot less than certain other missions. So just something to think about. So in this scenario where you are playing this aggressive approach and you're just kind of holding on to your primaries to get an effective momentum shift against someone who's just camping out on objectives, your strategy needs to be completely designed around disrupting their primary score. So the Custodes player, one thing they don't have going for them is that they're never disrupting the Dark Eldar's primary unless they can successfully shoot them off. So we have the, the very, the, the tricks of dedicated transport unit character, we have bodyguard, we got ways to not get shot off our backfield objectives. I mean, just two transports with two units aside is minimum four units have to shoot this problem away. It's just too much. So if the Custodes player can't really take the Dark Eldar player off their objectives, that's an advantage if the Dark Eldar, to be exploited, if the Dark Eldar player can take the Custodes players off theirs. So the Dark Eldar player needs to be looking at things like getting objective secured witches, downfield, and uh, having more models and objectives. This is completely suicidal, of course, but if you can suicide for a five point lead here uh, in a mission that's very stalemate by nature, or it can be very stalemate I should say, that could be a big swing. So definitely be looking for opportunities uh, with your aggressive play style to capture objectives. There's a couple avenues for approach when you're playing aggressively in this mission. Uh, a lot of it will become terrain dependent. Um, there's nothing in the middle of the table intrinsically. There are no objectives there. Uh, and unless you take a secondary like Oath of the Moment that forces you to go to the middle, there is no real value to going to the middle. So if that's where the terrain is, you might want to go here to launch your staging points. If it's not where the terrain is and the terrain's more on the sides, by all means, go to the sides. That's where the, this is where you want to be anyway. Uh, I'm just saying you, you have to follow the terrain and if your army needs terrain to stay alive, use the terrain. If you can tank it out like custodies, just go to where the objectives are. There's no, the custodies player never has to take a movement phase again. It sounds absurd, but it's honestly true. Um, whereas in the Dark Eldar player here, they're being aggressive. They have to go all over the place. How you go all over the place matters a lot. For an army as fragile as Dark Eldar, they probably want to do the terrain. Uh, although custodies don't really shoot, so maybe in this specific matchup you don't have to. That's kind of not the point here though. Uh, just follow the objectives. This is your bread and butter. So it's easy enough to take this approach where you hold these two like this and then you can launch surgical strikes onto these two. 
And remember, contesting one of these three while you're holding these three doesn't make the slightest difference to the scoreboard. It might get you a stranglehold, which we'll cover in a minute. But if I'm on these three, and they are on these two because I contested here or shot them off here or something, and this is the end of my turn, they're still gonna get 10 primary points. I haven't done anything. So I think it's much more valuable as the aggressive player in retrieval to instead of just constantly throwing a little bit of stuff out, a little bit of stuff out, a little bit of stuff out to contest one objective, doesn't do anything. Maybe it'll do a little bit if they took banners, but mostly doesn't do anything. Take a well-concentrated, well-timed, like precision type of turn that's enough of your force to make a real impact of the game and attack both objectives at once. Attack here and attack out of models. Easy slits. And attack here. Because if you can pull it off where you've contested two objectives in one turn, even if you only do this one time in the whole game, that's a five point swing in an otherwise stalemate match. The other approach to uh, playing the aggressive army from a movement perspective in retrieval, you can hard up one flank. This is again how terrain will dictate this in this kind of setup. It kind of tells you to just play forward and launch the points from this staging point. If there was a good line of sight blocker right here, you could make a very big case for setting up a bunch of raiders right here, whatever you have, and turning it kind of this hammer and anvil setup, turning it into a vanguard. Now you're letting this objective kind of fall away. You're making your life's mission to push this way while like holding these two. And now you can launch a sur surgical strike on this objective while keeping them at bay on this objective. So if you can maybe do some witches over here, this is kind of in your territory and based on how you moved it, this is kind of on their territory based on how they moved it. But their plan wasn't to hold this because their plan is to camp it out. So when the Telamon does start to move out, it's not too hard to contest it. It's not too difficult. It's not a big push. It's not concentrated. So this is a good way to terrain allowing it, hard forcing one flank, turning it from hammer and anvil to vanguard to dawn of war is a really good way to catch people off guard because their strategy is probably ones that's set in place for a an hammer and anvil deployment. This is a really good tactic if you are the faster army and they are the slower army because you can adjust and turn it into a, a vanguard than a dawn of war and just play that kind of game. They cannot, they're just out of position for that. So, Let's take a minute, digress, talk about secondaries. Um, secondaries for the aggressive army. Again, we of course want to take secondaries that make sense for our actual game plan. So our actual game plan is to flood the table, get our objectives handled to a point where we can handle them, and make surgical strikes onto our opponent's side of the board to mess up their defensive secondaries like banners, or just their primary score, or anything like that. So, if I'm getting, if my plan is to be all over the board, then engage in all fronts, great option. Alternatively, and I'm gonna throw this out there as a real one for the aggressive army here, you could do stranglehold. Um, reason being is because in the scenario where you need to engage for three points, you have to go deep into this quarter. This quarter is where all the custodies are which is something you want to do once or twice on a very precision-based turn, as we discussed, to make a surgical strike onto their objectives or primary points. It's not something you want to be doing all five turns. It's unsustainable getting yourself killed really fast. Unless you have tons and tons of chaff, which some army, it's like Dark Dowler, actually can manage. Not most armies cannot do that. So engage in a mission like retrieval can somewhat be a trap because, and, and this still get you a good score. You're never really gonna get less than 10 on engage unless you're really messing it up. Um, because you can do this quarter, this quarter, this quarter for three pretty easily. But if you're counting on a 15 for your scoreboard projection and you're, you're kinda not really feeling going into this quarter, or maybe you turn it into a stalemate type of game where you, you realize I don't actually have to do the, anything that the custodies aren't doing. Like I can just sit here the same way they can just sit there. Now you're really not engaging. So be mindful of that. In those games, you want to take Stranglehold. It's not hard in a lot of games to just hold these three. These three are very natural for you to hold and then potentially just shoot your opponent off one. Uh, that's pretty cool, especially if you have one of these two objectives that are just in the open and your opponent isn't being mindful about making sure that their eggs are in a row here and they can hold it regardless of your firepower. You can very easily steal objectives with just shooting people off. Very good tactic for Space Marine players because they actually have some pretty powerful shooting. 
uh, and they're not the fastest of factions. The alternative is you, if you're doing stranglehold, you know how I said about two minutes ago where if you, uh, there's no value to taking, on, to taking contesting one objective, if you're still leaving them on two in retrieval. If you're taking stranglehold and you don't have the kind of oppressive firepower to just knock people off objectives, this is where throwing five witches, five warriors, five whatevers onto that objective turn after turn after turn, if your list is designed to sustain that kind of loss, uh, yeah, trade that for five points every turn. I'll trade a unit for five points every turn. And then it's just a matter of just being in, on this one objective for stranglehold. Is that easier or harder than being in this quarter and this quarter for three on engage? That's kind of the question you have to ask yourself. But it's one or the other on that one. If I'm going to be all over the place, retrieve Octarius data is never a bad one especially if you have deep strikers, something that can get behind the Custodes army here and get into that corner effectively. That could be really good. But you, you got two quarters down, Pat. That's four points. It's not challenging. Well, I shouldn't say not challenging, but it's not, it's not really too challenging to score one of these two quarters, especially if they are only camping out on one of the quarters because that is actually in their best interest. You should be able to get this third one. That fourth one might be a challenge, but you're already sitting at a decent score of eight. Alternatively, you can do banners. I like taking banners as the aggressive player, even though it is a defensive secondary, if they're never going to be threatening my banners. I take it a lot in Dark Eldar, actually, because you can raise a banner here and here. The Custodes player, their strategy has nothing to do with taking you off your banners, nothing at all. If you can recognize that early, whatever you're playing against, and you realize they're just going to camp it out over there, take the banners. This is 10 points, just sitting there all game. Turns 2, 3, 4, 5, and at the end of the game, this is scoring, 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 scoring. Like I said, for the Custodes player taking banners and just running around end of the game, if in theory you have bottom at turn 5, for example, with the dark, as a Dark Eldar player, not only were you going to score that 15, because you can just hop out on the more objectives, you could also potentially just start placing banners. The Custodes player hasn't really kicked, started stepping out there. So that's something to consider, always that upswing. Um, so in an aggressive stance where you're feeding the army to keep them pushed in and in like that, backfield objectives are excellent banner places because no one's ever going to bother them. So if there's enough backfield objectives, and enough is just two. Two is all it takes. That's, uh, that's 10 points. You're good to go. Um, this is one where I wouldn't take grind them down. Um, you're definitely not looking to take minimized losses. This is one where, as the aggressive army, you're just throwing yourself out there. You're going to end up nearly tabled, um, but you might actually score enough points that it doesn't matter, especially if you're detracting from their score as well. That's kind of the overall strategy here. The last secondary here is, is fairly tough because uh, the mission secondary isn't helping you out. You've taken from your battlefield supremacy category. You've taken from your... Shadow operations category, so all that's left is the killing one. No mercy, no respite, or psychic secondaries, or codex secondaries. So if you have good codex secondaries, this is a great place to look. This might be one where taking oath at the moment could be good for you just to, uh, just to give you a score. But remember, there's no intrinsic value to going in the middle. There's no objectives here. So if the terrain placement was like this, I'd consider oath. You can kind of just walk right into it every turn. But if it's like this, and there's not much in the middle, there's no real reason to go in the middle, no, I'll take oath. Don't take oath at the moment. That's a space marine one that encourages you to be in the middle. Um, so this is why I always really like to build while we stand, we fight, or sorry, do the last options into lists. Um, I also like a lot when it's characters and things I don't have to use. Because even if I do have to play this aggressive strategy and, and approach this game in this manner, if I have three characters sitting back here costing me a total of 320 points, and they're not participating, but they score me 15 points at the end of the game. Most of my army got tabled, 1,700 points of my army got tabled, but these three jerks got me 15 points. I'm a happy camper. So I try to like set that up if I have an aggressive army still. Even though it's traditionally a defensive secondary, I think having that as a fallback plan is very important. But generally speaking, this is how you approach the retrieval mission. I think it's one of the most balanced missions, very fun, because it kind of lets any style work. Um, if you have any questions, let me know what you think. We can always ask them in the war room in the Facebook page or on our website. We always get back to you as soon as we can. Dive even deeper into competitive 40K and become a member of the world's most knowledgeable and positive community. The War Room is an exclusive group that brings together the world's best 40K players as coaches to help anyone from a newer player to an experienced tournament veteran learn, grow, and reach their goals within our shared hobby.
Each week we offer a variety of live stream coaching matches, centered around illuminating the thought process and in-game decision making of top players. We explain everything we're doing and why. You'll learn about the ever-evolving meta, match play mission theory, list making, and discussion of every faction in the game, and have access to analysis of all the latest rules. Our team of highly experienced coaches teach weekly clinics on each individual faction, strategy sessions on deployment and cool tricks, and meta-analyses each week during Meta Monday. We are committed to not only providing the best knowledge for players available, but also building a one-of-a-kind community. Come be a part of the War Room.